Oxford University boasts some of the prettiest academic buildings in the world. These grand palaces of learning are largely the preserve of the humanities. But because Professor Robin Dunbar is a scientist, he's forced to work here, in this architectural abomination, out of the sight of tourists and university website photographers. Here, geographically and aesthetically isolated, Dunbar causes people pain. <laughs> because he claims it throws light on why we laugh. So what we're doing here is we're looking to see whether pain threshold increases after you've laughed. First, the baseline measurement. OK, now. We have a winner. Stop. Good work. And now, the fun part. Professor Dunbar is an experimental psychologist and an evolutionary biologist. Which is quite a mouthful, but what it means is he's able to both formulate ideas about our species development and also test them in a lab. And one of his main ideas is about grooming. Monkeys and apes create their friendships, their relationships with each other and thereby bond their social groups by grooming, social grooming, grooming each other. It turns out that that light stroking triggers an endorphin response in the brain. <laughs> Robin's theory holds that laughter is effectively remote tickling, producing the same chemical high. And if he's right, the laughing volunteers in the lab will now be flushed with pain-beating endorphins and they'll beat their previous times in the wall-sit test. OK? Go. It's direct evidence that laughter does produce endorphins. Yes, um, you'd normally expect something between, on average, I don't know, about five seconds and anything up to 20 seconds increase in time, and that's pretty much what we have here. All statistically significant. <laughs> when this man started his career, his ideas were considered even more avant-garde than the buildings he now inhabits. Today, however, he's established a global reputation as one of the world's leading neurobiologists. And all because he discovered he could hear rats squeak. So you're hearing the squeaking through the ultrasound detector. If we didn't have these detectors on, you would not be hearing anything. Once he'd heard the squeaks, Panksepp was determined to discover what they might mean. One morning I woke up and said, what if that is laughter? And I uh, said, well, then you should be able to tickle animals. And we tickled the first rat and they chirped like crazy, the second rat. As a matter of fact, every rat, except uh, some really neurotic ones, have, uh, you know, chirped. To the casual observer, it might look like the rats aren't laughing at all, that their tiny chirps are in fact cries for help. 
But not only are the vocalizations identical to the noises made in play, the rat's behavior tells its own story. They are following my hand because it's a hand that has brought them great joy. <laughs> oh, he just bit me. <laughs> but he didn't hurt me. So it's their way of indicating, come on, let's play. Oh, <laughs> I love rats. <laughs> They're such fun animals, so smart and so emotional. As far as we can tell, we've got the same basic emotions as rats. But Pangsep's idea that rats have emotions did little to endear him to his colleagues. People say, you've been giving human qualities to animals, anthropomorphism, and I tell them, I have not been doing anything of the sort. I am doing zoomorphism. I am trying to understand the animal mind as a way to illuminate the human mind. The critics argue that our complex brains are so different to rats' brains that any comparison is meaningless. But the reality is, emotions occur in the evolutionary ancient brain, the part we share with all mammals, including rats. And we know that animals that have been bred for high laughter are resistant to depression. That means they have chemistries that protect them against the vicissitudes of life. Animals that have been bred for low laughter are susceptible to depression. If we understand animal emotional processes at the fundamental instinctual level, I think we will have a science of human basic emotions, and that's very valuable for understanding ourselves and having a more sophisticated biological psychiatry. Pangsep's idea was to use the rat's laughter to identify the precise area in the ancient brain involved in happiness, and in so doing, to identify the neurochemistry responsible. Using that approach, a group from Northwestern University in Chicago identified a happiness neurotransmitter. They call it GLX-13. Catchy. And they've also developed a drug to stimulate its production. In 2013, they started human clinical trials. The results were so impressive that two years later, it was bought by a drugs company for $560 million. Surprising as it is, $560 million is not bad for buying the rights to the most powerful item on the horizon. It's a new way of treating depression, an antidepressant that, instead of reducing sadness, promotes happiness. It's an approach that shows great promise. And all this from tickling rats. Rat laughter forces you to think about the molecules of social joy. And so, you know, I am pleased and surprised in retrospect that we got that far. And, uh, you know, that's one of the wonderful things of science. There's always surprises. <laughs>